Hello, my name is Derek Atkins, and this is the third video lecture on bioethics. And this, these lectures are for the Church, Society, and Ethical Issues in Asia course at the East Asia School of Theology. So now we come to the third video lecture of this series of lectures on bioethical issues and reproductive ethical issues. Um, in the first video, we talked about abortion. In the second video, we looked at the issue of reproductive um, technology, basically fertility treatments, as well as the issue of cloning, which involved not only fertility treatment, but also the question of genetic engineering. And now in our third, this, in this third video, we are going to look at the issue of euthanasia. So if you have not yet watched the first two videos on abortion and fertility treatment, please do so. The last issue we're going to discuss in this series of video lectures is the issue of euthanasia. This issue is especially difficult because it often involves close family members, which means these end of life decisions have a lot of emotional layers to them. Many of you will become pastors and as our societies age, you will be faced with people coming to you for guidance in making end of life decisions for their loved ones, or at the very least seeking comfort from you as they wrestle with these difficult decisions. So to begin our discussion, we first need to define euthanasia and several other terms involved in this debate. So, euthanasia is the deliberate, that is, intentional act of intending or choosing a painless death for the humane purpose of ending the agony of someone who suffers from incurable disease or injury. And this word, euthanasia, comes from two Greek words, eu, which means good, and Thanos, which means death. So euthanasia literally means good death. The next term is palliative care. Palliative care is specialized medical care that is focused on providing patients with relief from pain and other symptoms of a serious illness. So the focus is not on curing the disease, but on making the patient as comfortable as possible. Um, and so the focus is often on pain management. Now, there are several types of euthanasia. There is active euthanasia, which is the direct administration of a lethal substance to a patient by another party with a merciful intent. There is passive euthanasia, which is withholding or withdrawing life-sustaining treatment in order to hasten death. And passive euthanasia often involves withholding food or water from a patient who is seriously ill or who is close to dying. There is assisted suicide in which a person actively assists a patient at the patient's request to end their life. And then there is physician-assisted suicide in which a medical doctor actively assists a patient at the patient's request to end their life. Um, this may be done at the request of the patient or when the patient is no longer capable of offering consent, it may be 
uh, done at the request of some other person, such as a family member or legal guardian. Now, um, voluntary, there are three other types of euthanasia I want to mention. There is voluntary euthanasia in which euthanasia is performed at the patient's request. There is involuntary euthanasia in which euthanasia is performed without the patient's consent. And then there is non-voluntary euthanasia in which euthanasia is performed when the patient is incapable of consent. So in the third in the non-voluntary category, the patient is unable to give consent. So uh, the doctors and others involved do not know one way or the other whether the patient wants to live or to die. So that's non-voluntary euthanasia. Now, those who support euthanasia have advanced many arguments in favor of abort of euthanasia. Here, we're going to look at several of these arguments. The first argument is the argument of personal rights. Those who advocate euthanasia often argue that individuals should have the right to choose when and how they die based on principles of personal autonomy and self-determination. Here, autonomy is understood as the patient's right to make decisions relating to his or her life so long as their decisions cause no harm to others. Because autonomy is a deeply rooted value in many modern societies, any limits on autonomy it's viewed as an infringement on personal rights. For example, consider the enormous popularity of the slogan, my body, my choice. For example, in 2022, a church in Canada held a crossing over ceremony for Betty Sanguine, a member who chose to end her life who chose to end her life in the church sanctuary through medically assisted suicide. Betty Sanguin suffered from ALS, also known as Lou Gehrig's disease. And so this photo shows her seated in a very comfortable chair um, while she was waiting to die. And she was visited by several by friends and family members during this crossing over ceremony. Now, autonomy does have its place and it is a valuable, it is a value worth holding, but when it comes to ethical issues like such as abortion and euthanasia, we must recognize that there should be limits to our autonomy. This recognizes the teaching of 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 19 and 20, that our bodies belong to the Lord. Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your body. Another reason given for um, euthanasia is compassion. Euthanasia is often justified on grounds of compassion. The argument is that ending the life of someone who suffers from great pain and especially chronic pain is an act of compassion because doing so brings the pain that person is suffering to an end. Now, this view is based upon the assumption that pain, and especially chronic pain, is the greatest evil a person can suffer. This view also betrays a failure 
to see any redemptive dimension in suffering. However, the Bible clearly teaches that suffering can serve redemptive ends. For example, Job, the book of Job is a profound meditation on suffering. And of course, in that book, Job goes through a great deal of suffering. And in the end, all the suffering that Job went through brought him into a deeper relationship with God. And of course, there is Christ, the example of Jesus Christ. His suffering on the cross was the act of redemptive suffering because Christ's suffering brought redemption to all of humanity. There is another argument that supporters of euthanasia make, and that is they argue that the distinction between active euthanasia and passive euthanasia is not significant at all, since both forms of euthanasia lead to the same result, the death of the patient. James, and, and to support this um, argument further, some people use James Rachel's hypo hypothetical case. And um, in this hypothetical case, there are two different people, Mr. Smith and Mr. Jones. Both have six-year-old cousins and both stand to inherit a fortune should anything happen to their cousins. Mr. Smith proceeds to drown his cousin while his cousin takes a bath, while Mr. Jones intends to do the same, but his cousin has an accident while taking a bath and drowns while Mr. Jones does nothing to prevent the drowning, thereby letting the child die. And so um, proponents of euthanasia argue that this hypothetical case illustrate how there is very actually very little difference between active euthanasia and passive euthanasia, because in both cases, the result is the same, the death of the patient. Now, we've looked at some arguments for euthanasia. Let's look at some arguments against euthanasia. The first argument against euthanasia is the sanctity of life. This is the view that human life is of utmost value and should be protected by all means possible. This view can have both religious and secular foundations. Historically, Christians have affirmed the value of human life from the moment of conception to its natural end. This affirmation is based upon biblical passages such as Genesis 9, 6, Psalm 139, 13 through 16, and elsewhere in scriptures. This belief in the sanctity of life extends throughout the entire life cycle from conception to death, and it's based on the biblical teaching that all humans are created in the image of God. Now, some secularists also believe in the sanctity of life, but instead of basing their belief on the doctrine of the image of God, they would argue that life is precious and that no price tag can be placed on human life. Another argument against euthanasia is the argument that euthanasia is murder. Um, and this would be true, especially of active euthanasia, which involved the deliberate taking of human life by active means, usually by administering some kind of poisonous substance or giving an overdose of some medication. Now, interestingly enough, there is a question as to whether withholding food and water from a patient constitutes murder. Gilbert Meliander, 
argues that providing food and water should not be classified as medical care since all of us need food and water to live, whether we are healthy or ill. Based on this reasoning, Meliander contends that food and water should not be withheld from any patient, except in cases where the provision of food and water is proven to be excessively burdensome to the patient. There is another argument against euthanasia, and that is the, ex the expansion of the application of euthanasia. One, one troubling trend we've seen with euthanasia is that in those countries and states where euthanasia has been made legal, there has always been a subsequent expansion of the situation where euthanasia is allowed. In most places where euthanasia has been legalized, euthanasia is originally limited only to cases involving terminal illnesses. But then, as time goes by, the definition of terminal illnesses becomes expanded to include other categories, such as those who suffer from chronic illnesses or permanent disabilities. This is because once it is decided that certain lives are not worth living, it becomes very easy to decide that other lives are also not worth living. What's more, once euthanasia becomes legal, people suffering from any number of terminal or chronic diseases or even from permanent disabilities move from having a right to die to having a duty to die. In a world where many parents choose not to have children because they believe the cost of raising children is too expensive, the same logic can be applied to one's aging parents. They can become increasingly viewed as being too expensive to allow to continue living. The Netherlands experience with euthanasia is quite instructive. Euthanasia was legalized in 2001, with the law coming into force in 2002. So euthanasia has been legal in the Netherlands for 20 plus years now. During the past 20 years or so, euthanasia in the Netherlands has become a common option for people who are approaching the end of their lives. Significant numbers of doctors have also performed euthanasia without the consent of patients. Sometimes doctors have disguised acts of euthanasia by simply sedating patients until patients die. So this leads us to a very key question in the whole euthanasia debate. And that is, when does death occur? Most people would say that death occurs when the heart stops beating and breathing ceases. But what if a person is no longer capable of understanding and reasoning? Their hearts and lungs still function, but all of their higher brain functions are gone. This condition is known as a persistent vegetative state. Now, here is the definition of persistent vegetative state. It is a condition in which a patient has a functioning brain stem, but no consciousness or cognitive function. Now, this is also related to brain death, which is a condition in which one's entire brain has died. Uh, and now there is a problem with brain death and with persistent vegetative states. And that is thousands of patients have only partial brain death. Their brains are still able to regulate organs such as hearts and lungs, but they no longer have the capacity for social interaction. And this 
gets back to the question of what makes us human. As, as Christians, we know that the Bible teaches that there is more to being human than merely the physical, having a physical body. There is also the social, you know, aspect. We have, we are able to have relationship with God. We're able to have relationship with other people. We also have reasoning and creative abilities. All of these go into making us humans. So if a person loses all these functions and abilities, is that person no longer a person? Has that person died? So you can see how the question of when a person dies, it's also closely tied to the question of what makes a person a human being? There is also what's known as neocortical death. Neocortical, in neocortical death, neocortical functions are irretrievably lost. Now, just to make clear, the neocortex is the outer brain covering of the cerebrum, excuse me, and is responsible for the higher brain functions, including memory, language, including talking, reading, and writing, reasoning and rational thought, creativity, and social interaction. All of these are considered to be higher brain functions. And these functions are controlled or at least um, made possible by the neocortex. So neocortical death occurs when the neocortex dies. You know, all those functions that are part of the neocortex are irretrievably lost. Yet the main stem um, still, continue, still continues to live, and therefore the heart, lungs, and other bodily functions continue to, to work. Now, one thing that makes it difficult to define when brain death or neocortical death has occurred are reports of patients who have been diagnosed as being in persistent vegetative states who have shown signs of being aware of themselves or their environments. For example, this included a, a, a situation where one such patient gave a thumbs up sign well, that shows that that patient is aware to some extent of what's happening around them. In other cases, patients have actually woken up after being in persistent vegetative states, such as a young man who was injured in a car accident at age 19. This young man spent some time in a persistent vegetative state and woke up 19 years after his accident and said, mom, within three days of waking up, he had regained complete verbal fluency. Another patient, Juan Torres, who is seen in this picture, woke up from being in a persistent vegetative state with memories of being in a persistent vegetative state. Cases like these illustrate the difficulty of defining when death actually occurs and suggest the need to be more cautious in defining when death has truly taken place. So we've seen with, you, the, with the issue of euthanasia that there are some key questions. When does death occur? And what makes us human? Because you know, if we lose those qualities that make us truly human, does that mean we have died? 
Now, these same questions are also part of the other um, bioethic issues that we've looked at in this video lecture series. We've seen that there are three core issues that underlie all of these ethical issues, whether they are abortion, um, fertility treatment, cloning, or euthanasia. And these core questions are, when does life begin? What makes us human? And when does death occur? So these are some really key issues, key questions to ask when trying to navigate all of these issues. Now, these issues also have a pastoral dimension, as I've mentioned earlier, because people who are trying, who are struggling with these issues are really having great difficulty trying to decide what is the right thing to do. And so as pastors, we need to be able to give them not only um, sound biblical counseling and give them um, sound theological reasoning and sound biblical um, verses to address their issues, we also need to address the emotional side because um, many of these people are dealing with um, major emotional issues because these issues have lots, often have many emotional layers. So we need to be aware of these issues. We need to know um, the, the ethical issues that are involved the ethical questions that are involved. We also need to know the biblical values that are involved. And we need to have a heart of understanding and compassion to help our, ourselves, our family members, and those whom we counsel as they walk through these difficult issues. So we will talk more about these ethical issues in class.